I remember reading this um, uh, magazine on, a, on an aircraft which talked about the solar farms and how they can break even in about seven years' time. And I kind of linked that idea of seven years of break, uh, break even point in solar farms to housing, which is generally 25 to 30 years of, of mortgage payments. So I said, if I was to take this money and make more money over 14 to 21 years, for example, I could maybe in an alternative model where I could feed that extra money to finance the cost of the house. And that's how the idea of Billion Bricks Homes and Communities was born, that can we build these large solar farms under which communities could be built and there could be a cross-financing mechanism to solve the housing crisis. So that's essentially it. You build a solar farm, and underneath that solar farm, you build houses. Absolutely. And then the solar farm not only feeds the houses with their energy, but gives uh, surplus energy, which can then be sold to monetize the cost of the house. Yeah. And then, I mean, once we had this idea in place, we went in to do some quick back-of-the-envelope con calculations. I mean, I... I understand the architecture and the real estate side, so I knew what does it cost to build homes and what would it cost to put solar panels on the homes. And we came up with some numbers where we said, okay, can we produce about 40 times more energy than what the community would consume and push that energy out into the grid? And that would enable us a model to finance almost 100% of the cost of the house. And do those numbers add up? You can, you can have a, enough solar panel uh, real estate, if you like, to drive all those houses and generate surplus? Oh, so it, it does. So the numbers do add up, but the numbers are also, which I wouldn't say are generic, right? Because there's so many factors which influence cost of energy, cost of land, cost of construction, cost of finance. Mm. So it's not a blanket idea that I can say works everywhere. But the point is that it allows for us an entry point to cross-financing housing in a very, very affordable market, which traditionally has people not have not achieved unless they have access to philanthropic money or government money, but not by using risk capital. Break it down a little bit more for me. Is there more to it than simply putting solar panels on roofs? Or how does the architecture itself work? How are you building those houses? What are the other elements that you're putting into these houses? Yeah, so I think once we had the big idea in place, then we had to go in and see what are the other elements that are needed to enable that, right? And that's where a lot of technological piece came in to say how close can we build the uh, uh, construction of the houses in a way which is fast, where, uh, which, is, uh, which allows for solar panels to be put uh, on the roofs, but at the same time, which reduces the friction of what takes actually community to be built. So what I mean by friction is that community development is very complex, right? So it's not only about houses, it's not only about energy, it's about water, it's about waste, it's about jobs, it's about people. So that's when we went on to say, okay, can we build houses where the dependencies on all these other institutions to come in is reduced? And can we build communities which are completely self-sustaining uh, uh, from a water, a waste, and jobs and other, other facilities which are needed as well. Tell me about that community. I mean, this, this is a really interesting aspect of the whole project, is that it's not simply a, a building and development project. This is something that has a social component too. Tell me how you envisage that and how can you build a community from scratch? So the goal is really to, once we build this large solar farm and we bring in all these families, then what do we do with them, right? So we look at the families as a human resource that now the place where they are living in can be tapped into. So we have access to children that we can provide better education to. We have access to all these adult people. We can provide better opportunities for, for jobs. We have all these women who can have access to jobs or we can run other women-based programs as well. But really build a community which will, in one generation, can come out of poverty. And we are not talking about incremental change because our belief is that incremental change is too slow. You and I, through incremental change, increase much faster than the poor, and hence the inequality gap keeps increasing. So our goal is within a generation of about 20 to 25 years, how can we leapfrog them into a lower middle income or a, a, a lower income bracket, all the way from being the poorest to the poor? That's, I mean, that, that really is using tech for impact in, in a major way. The, the community aspect of it could end up being really remarkably transformational. But to be cynical about this for a second, it's not easy to build communities that way. How does the governance system work? Who runs the tech? Who um, administers the, the business side of things? And how do you ensure that that community is a community of people that will actually get on with each other? 
Yeah. So one is I don't have a good answer to this, right? Because, I mean, these are all our hypothetical situations uh, that we are dealing with today. But our belief is, is threefold. One is that when people come and live in these communities, there is a value attachment that, uh, that we put on them to ensure that they feel as members of this community. So it's just not about the fact that you're getting homes, but do you believe in taking care of the community? Do you believe in being friends with your, with your neighbor and contributing back to the society as well? That's number one criteria. The second area of our work is where we want to be engaged with the community for about 20 to 25 years. That's the lifespan in which we'll be able to pay the money back to the, to the financiers. So during that time, we are, you can really look at us as property managers in some way, where we'll not only be managing the solar panels, the community development, but also working with the community to provide access to education, access to jobs, and, and linking them up with other resources out there as well. And the third is really the fact where tech comes in, where we'll provide them with, with like a tech platform or, or, or an app system where the moment you become members of, of the community, of Billion Bricks community, you have access to resources that you, you would otherwise not have access to, which is you can see your finances, you have access to financial institutions, you have access to uh, job markets, you have access to government um, 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 uh, support systems that are out there, and then you have access to customer care service. You can connect to other Billion Bricks communities in other parts of the world. Because at the end of the day, we human beings want that connection. And house is just a way or, or just the first step in empowering people to take control of their lives. You talked earlier on about scalability. How do you scale this idea? What, um, what can you tell a government, for instance, or I'm assuming that the governments are part of your planning mechanism. You'll need the land, you'll need the access to infrastructure and that kind of stuff. How do you sell this to a government in a country where you're not currently operational? So I think scalability is, is crucial to us, right? I mean, the basis of Billion Bricks is that there are great solutions out there, but they don't scale. You can do one pilot, you can do one project, but how do you make them scalable? And that's where I think the businesses come into place, where they're highly scalable. And there's a direct connection between what a business is offering to the customer. And that's where I think we come in to say that we look at the people and the community that we are building as a customer. Now, that customer in some cases could be the government, but in some cases may not be the government as well. So we want to be as independent as possible to go in as a developer, buy our own land, build this community, raise capital, bring in the people, provide them access to homes, work with them, and then exit out in 25 years when they can then operationalize on their own. What have been the biggest obstacles, whether they be uh, regulatory or legislative obstacles or just mind frame obstacles where people don't get what you're trying to do? So it's, it's an interesting question, right? So the advantage in the social sector is that everyone likes your idea, right? So you go in there and nobody would say, oh, it's, a, it's not a good idea or I don't like it, right? So the kind of, the connection to the idea is strong and that allows us to open a lot of doors, which I think to, traditionally would not be easy for us. But then comes the due diligence part and digging deeper into it, which is where I think we are finding a, a, a lot of good success uh, in, in being able to, uh, to take the conversations forward uh, and people are coming up with saying, okay, we've got land here, would you be willing to work with us? Or the government institutions are coming forward to say, okay, is this a way we can stretch this project together? They also see the value in doing the first project today to say that it has never been done before. And I think once it succeeds, then I think the, the uh, ability of people to understand and replicate this will allow us to move much faster. What about the, one of the biggest practical problems with solar farms and power is again government-led. Uh, and that is access to the grid. Oh, no, sir, not government-led, it's, it's government and business, but access to the grid is an issue. There are some countries which won't give you access, feed-in tariffs. How do you get over that? Then we don't go to that country, right? So, so we, we know that the primary revenue for us is energy. The only countries we go to are where energy is allowed to be sold by a private player like us onto the grid or to the government. So Philippines is one of them, India is one of them, United States is one of them. And I think globally there are about 17 countries which are much, much more forward as opposed to a lot of other countries. And I think that those 17 countries give us enough market 